Hi, I'm Tracy Tomac, and in this session, we will be covering winning upfront with denial prevention and avoidance, using your ADT data and pair specific rules to stop the denial freight train. Speaking with me today is Kendall Smith, Chief Physician Advisor for Intersect Healthcare and Appeal Masters, which is a leading appeal educator and appeal services firm for hospitals and health systems. Dr. Smith has been deeply involved in denial and appeals management throughout his hospitalist career, working collaboratively with UR and case management departments, as well as managed care and hospital C-suite executives. He has served as a physician leader on hospital revenue cycle management teams, while also serving as a physician advisor for clinical resource management. Dr. Smith is also an AHIMA ICDM ICD CMPCS approved trainer and ambassador. And I'm Tracy Tomac, Associate Director of Training and Education for Intersect Healthcare, where I'm responsible for coordinating training for clients in the use of Veracity Audit and Denial Management Software System, and also responsible for client outreach to ensure that clients are fully utilizing Veracity in order to most effectively and efficiently manage commercial and government audits and denials. I do have over 20 years of experience in revenue cycle with a focus on hospital coding, charge capture, and denial management. So today we're gonna to talk about how you can move from denial management to a true denial avoidance program. Denial management in the past has been very reactionary, really focused on reacting to denials from payers rather than working on preventing them. And then at some point along the way, after the patterns of behavior that we discovered, we were able to start really preventing denials by looking back at those denials collectively and deciding where we needed to actually um, start that denial prevention, that process improvement initiative. Today, using intelligence in uh, different um, data modules, as well as AI, we can start to truly avoid denials in true real-time prevention using AI coupled with your ADT and HL7 data. So the current state of hospital denials in 2021 indicate that 34% of all hospital charges resulted in a denial. Of those, your inpatient claims averaged $5,300 per denial and outpatient claims were averaging $585 per denial. Some of the reasons cited were bundling charges, some registration errors, information needed, and authorization issues with missing documentation being cited as one of the primary reasons for all of the above. So how has COVID-19 affected hospital denials? Well, it's been noted that 40% of all COVID-related cases have resulted in denials and inpatient claims accounted for 20% of those denials. So how did we get here? Well, we all feel like we are living a real life Groundhog Day, really managing or trying to manage those denials that we repetitively see over and over again, such as authorization denials, um, certain procedures, not having the documentation to show medical necessity, as well as our inpatients not being approved as inpatient, but rather payers, payers wanting to pay them as observation. So how do we begin to harness um, some data to affect change? Well, we can use common data sets that we already have available in our system, such as ADT and HL7, to really get down to identifying potential denials where they start, maybe even while the patient is still in house or as close to discharge as possible. In this way, we can start to prevent costly appeals after our services have been billed and really um, even before that claim has gone out the door if we're using truly um, live data as it is happening as that patient is being seen through the system for services in our hospitals. So what is ADT data anyway? Well, ADT stands for admissions, discharge and transfers, 
and it typically includes demographic information such as the patient's name, address, phone numbers that we typically see upon arrival, as well as the patient's movement through that hospital stay. So obviously we start with the registration of the patient, we may see the patient changing rooms, um, moving throughout the house and having different services provided to them. In the ADT feed, it is one way data can be sent to an application or to a provider from a clinic or hospital information system. So again, we're seeing almost all of the data points available to us for that patient and that hospital stay within ADT. So what is HL7? Well, HL7 is the Health Level 7 International and it is a common digital language between all HIS systems, so we can share information across providers. It is in a standard format used to empower global health data interoperability, again, being able to exchange data among providers. So why would we want to use this ADT and HL7 in denial management? Well, the ADT notification platforms are uh, lightweight, fast, and easy to implement. They're already available to your IS departments and really just need to be to redirected in other ways in order to identify some triggers that may lead to denial prevention. So how do we justify this ADT HL7 interface with our IT departments who are already struggling with resources uh, for other projects? Well, ADT and HL7 frameworks are already being sent to many other systems, and therefore this should be a rapid implementation or a rapid um, uplift for your IT resources to quickly and easily direct this same data to other workflows and providers for real-time review and truly to get down to a denial avoidance program. You need to be prepared to discuss with your IT department and any other committees this critical need for real-time data. You might want to have some dollars behind some of the data, the denials that you're already seeing, and really this data again is already in place, simply needs to be redirected to another system that you might be working in to identify denials. And this data is really key to working potential denials at their source, again, while the patient is still in house and being provided services. So using this ADT and HL7 data, we can start to um, create alerts and triggers that being, can be created to identify specific items that we want to watch or work during patient encounters, such as patients who are inpatient who maybe don't have an inpatient order. Maybe those patients are receiving high dollar procedures such as a cardiac implant and we want to make sure that we have the necessary documentation for the payers that we are going to be billing for those procedures. So watch lists and work lists can be created based on these events which can lead to alerts. So again, um, using that ADT information, that HL7 information, we can really start to identify denials at their source and hopefully stop this payer freight train that continues to come at us. We continue to see the same issues over and over again. So how do we really start getting down to preventing those at their source? Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Smith to talk a little more, bit more about that. Great, thanks Tracy. Um, so for those of us that have been involved in handling denials and appeals um, for the past few years, I, I think this, this slide would uh, really hit home. Um, over and over again, uh, in, in my course of, of working um, appeals and denials, I'd see the same types of denials from the same payer for the same physician for the same procedure coming in a few months apart. And, and the one realization that came from this was that unless we were able to get this information to the clinician in real time, um, the basis for the denial, uh, whatever critical flaw existed um, in the authorization process or the documentation process, 
was that we were going to just be uh, plagued with these de denials um, forever and ever. So what we're going to talk about is a shift from working in a, a back-end environment to an intelligent front-end environment and a new term that we've coined um, along the lines of clinical documentation integrity, but what um, Tracy and I now call PDI or payer documentation integrity. So the three R's, these are the three basic R's that are, are, are responsible um, in, in getting information to a clinician to make sure that a claim uh, ultimately gets paid or in the event of failure of one of these three R's, you're going to result in the fourth R, recoupment. Um, the three R's consist of the right person, so you have to have the appropriate person or persons handling the documentation, documentation that comports or, or follows the payer-specific requirement, and more specifically, this has to occur at the right time. It can't occur after a procedure has happened. Um, if you take, for example, the uh, case of a total knee replacement where the insurer is requiring eight weeks of physical therapy uh, before they authorize surgery, if you go ahead and do uh, surgery after six weeks of physical therapy, you can't go order an additional two weeks of, of physical therapy after the procedure and have it count. Um, in that case, you're going to have a denial because the uh, surgery didn't comport or follow the payer-specific requirements. Um, ultimately, the payers uh, make the rules, and we're bound to those rules through the contracts the hospital enters into. Um, every insurer from uh, traditional Medicare uh, through commercial plans is capable and, and fully within their rights to have unique rules as to how they'll pay for medical care and how they, what they define as being medically necessary. There is no universal definition um, that they're obligated to follow. And with that comes a lot of complexity. So the concept of payer documentation integrity, I believe, is where the, the future of denial and appeals is heading. Um, ultimately, what we're talking about are denial proofing and audit proofing episodes of care, um, either before the episode occurs or while the patient's in the hospital. They're incumbent on, on us in this process is an ability to learn to speak payerese or payer-specific language. As I mentioned earlier, the payers, uh, each at an individual basis, are able to define what they consider as, as being medically necessary for a procedure, for inpatient care, for example, or for a pacemaker, as we'll look at in a little bit. And it's incumbent on, on the hospital staff, the clinician, to be able to document according to that payer-specific language. Um, the insurer gets to define what hoops um, the doctor and patient in the hospital have to jump through. Not all the hoops are the same, and um, these things are constantly changing. If you look at clinical policy bulletins by insurer, um, you'll see that they're updated sometimes once or even twice a year. And with that, with those updates may come some significant changes if the clinician's not made aware of those changes and that incorporated into an episode of care. When the auditors come back and, and look at the episode of care, it's probably going to result in a denial for noncompliance. So, pair documentation integrity. Um, to me, this is what I think of as the next generation or the next evolution of uh, CDI, clinical documentation, documentation integrity. CDI specialists um, are already working within the medical record. Um, looking to help clinicians document uh, according to specific coding guidelines. So it's not a significant stretch to imagine a future where CDI specialists, um, in addition to being familiar with coding guidelines, are also familiar with payer-specific guidelines and work um, with clinicians to make sure that their documentation follows payer-specific rules. Um, we have the mantra, um, at Intersect that PDI is the new CDI. Um, the ground has shifted from capturing um, appropriate uh, medical diagnoses to ensuring that the documentation in the record um, follows a payer documentation compliance. We all need an early warning system, or otherwise this is going to become very, very chaotic. You, you've got tens, twenties, hundreds of insurers um, that you may be in network or out of network with, 
Um, each of them is capable of developing their own rules. So what we're really looking at and, and thinking of here is an automated system to be able to capture um, and automate payer-based rules and status-based rules, um, provide alerts to an individual in the system. This could be a PDI or CDI nurse. It could be the clinician at the point of, of care in the clinic or the hospital. Um, it could be a registration uh, technician that sort, certain elements may be missing. You may be missing admission order. You may be off missing an authorization number. And we want to get that information timely because if the care goes ahead without that information as part of the, the medical record, you can't go back in and get it after the fact. You can appeal to your blue in the face. If you're missing a prior off for a uh, hospital um, surgery or an inpatient admission, you're never gonna be able to get it after the fact. It's gonna be denied. Um, is not medically necessary. So using the HL7 data feed and ADT feeds, ADT feeds that Tracy had mentioned originally to develop alerts here um, for key elements that are, are necessary and have to be documented and incorporated into the medical record during an episode of care um, becomes uh, significant and ultimately will reduce the amount of manual work that has to be done as we automate this. The goal of having hospital staff uh, clinicians, uh, nurses, uh, registration, um, everyone uh, to work smarter, not harder. Um, we propose consider the hospitals consider repurposing and rebranding um, CDI with uh, PDI. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a big overlap between being aware of specific um, documentation requirements. Uh, for coding um, as to overlap with specific documentation requirements uh, to comply with uh, payer policies and guidelines. Um, so here's a, a perfect example of three R's. This is um, about a $75,000 um, denial. Um, this was from a Medicare audit after the procedure was done. Um, the patient had a cardiac defibrillator implanted um, as an outpatient, and the audit came back saying there was insufficient documentation to support the procedure. You see the ICD-10 codes there. Um, and what was missing specifically was documentation of a shared decision-making tool between the patient and the physician using an evidence-based tool uh, reflecting the risks and benefits of ICDs uh, prior to the ICD implantation. So you can see that going out and getting the patient to sign this document after the ICD has been implanted, the patient's been discharged and this denial pops up, is not going to work. Getting hold of the cardiologist, the electrophysiologist, or the surgeon and asking them to provide a letter of medical necessity as to the defibrillator here is not going to work. The only thing that was going to work was getting an alert to the clinician while the patient was in the clinic considering this ICD, um, alerting the clinician that he or she needed to work with the patient and get this evidence-based tool signed in on the chart before booking the surgery. Clearly not something that folks in the registration um, or in the operating room are necessarily going to be aware of unless this is done through an automated process. This is just a portion of what CMS requires in the record related to ICDs. Remember, these are fifty dollars to $80,000 um, procedures. What they're looking for is a understanding from the patient um, that they are clearly involved in their care, that they've got two possible paths related to this very expensive device. Um, what happens, should they choose to have it implanted in terms of quality of life and life expectancy? Um, or what would happen in terms of life expectancy, quality of life, should they not choose to have this implanted? And, and so clearly we're handing medical decision-making as it appropriately should be um, back to patients through this process. And CMS is looking to see that these notes are on the chart, that they're dated before the surgery, and again, you can't go back and get one of these things dated after the fact and then add it to the chart. Um, timing is everything. I, I think that speaks volumes. 
Um, as I said over and over, you can't get this after the fact. Ideally, we'd like a uh, service or procedure where this all bubbles up um, to get the appropriate medical necessity criteria um, in the office at the point of care where surgery is being con uh, considered. Um, this will avoid uh, later complications. So in an ideal situation, if you're an orthopedic surgeon and you're considering doing a total knee on your patient, um, at the time that you're scheduling that total knee, you would get an alert uh, using the ADT and HL7 data um, within the hospital system that you have this patient, you're booking them for an elective surgery, and that data would then link to um, the insurer's coverage policy bulletin uh, providing the physician with the specific information necessary to ensure payment and coverage of that specific surgery. Remember when your registration department or your front desk uh, seeks an authorization for surgery, there's often fine print at the bottom of that, which says authorization is essentially not a guarantee of payment. All the authorization process uh, does generally is, is tell you that the patient has benefits and the, those benefits will cover the planned procedure. Um, it can be a bit misleading in that linked to those benefits or that planned procedure and often lurking behind the scenes is a coverage policy bulletin or pro coverage policy guideline that specifies when the uh, specific procedure or surgery will be covered. And that's what we need to get to the clinician, the time the decision's made uh, to book the surgery to make sure that they've met all of the data elements um, that the, the insurer sets forth specific to that surgery. Again, you can't capture these after the fact and count on payment. So how would this appear? Um, as we look at the denial avoidance process, payer documentation uh, integrity, it's a multi-step process. Um, the procedure would be identified with specificity. You're going for a total knee arthroplasty of the right knee. Um, computer system would automatically link this, let's say, to Aetna's coverage policy bulletin because the registration information in the system says the patient's covered under a Aetna PPO plan. And this would be pulled up uh, for the physician in the clinic. The clinical indications would appear in the medical record um, at the time of that visit when the uh, surgery is being considered. And it would tell the physician, for example, that the patient might need a month uh, trial of specific non-steroidal therapy. They may need to wear a brace for eight weeks. They may need a trial of physical therapy for two months. And then and only then, after all those things are done, um, would the surgery be considered approved and, and paid for. Remember, if you just ask the insurance company at this point and, and ask the front desk to schedule the surgery, what you're gonna get is a response that yes, the patient has uh, coverage for this particular surgery, but lurking in the background are these CPBs um, with a medical necessity, very similar to what I just discussed. Um, exclusions and special notes uh, often exist in these things. Um, they may include pitfalls and special issues often outside of the physician's awareness. Um, I looked at CPBs for spinal stimulators. Uh, interestingly, one insurance company uh, required, um, I think it was at least eight sessions with a psychologist or psychiatrist um, related to the patient's chronic pain before they would approve a, and, and pay for a spinal stimulator. Clearly not something that's gonna be on the radar of most anesthesiology uh, pain specialists or neurologists considering this. Um, very payer specific, only a couple payers require this. And, and so you can't expect a clinician to carry this information in their head. Ideally, we'd link this to the current CPB um, and we can link to the source data um, and make it available throughout the process. Um, through a clickable link or um, a pop-up within the medical record. So we'll turn this back to Tracy at this point. Thank you, Dr. Smith. So we've talked a lot about uh, payer requirements, um, really trying to get down to payer intelligence. So how do we really get there? Well, the payers uh, define through their policies, their requirements, and really trying to get that payer policy information in the hands of our appeal writers is going to be very important. 
So getting information such as the CMS LCDs, NCDs, and your commercial payers policies, very specific to some of the items that Dr. Spence spoke to, um, very specific related to procedures, to certain services being provided, and even certain drugs that are being provided to our patients. Very important to have this timely policy information in front of our appeal writers. So let's say goodbye to the paper, uh, payer paper trail. We know that um, a lot of our staff members writing appeals for so many years have just had on um, spreadsheets, sticky notes, um, outdated binders, the provider and payer related information. So we really want to get this content um, for the provider specific policy rules again at the fingertips of our appeal staff so how do we manage that and how do we get that embedded in their work list so that they don't have to go out um, and search for this very detailed information that they need to make sure that we have the documentation for medical necessity to get paid for services that we've provided what do we need to include in this payer content well it's very important because the payers do define their documentation requirements and payer policies, but they also define when you must respond to their denials, the timeframes. Um, they'll, you know, some of them will give you 30 days, some 60 days, some 120 days. Again, we need to be providing this information at the fingertips of our appeal writers so that we don't miss any important deadlines due to the payer. We also have timeframes where the payer is supposed to respond to us. This is very important as well in follow-up and making sure that we don't have cases continuing to hang out there in our AR and aging. We need to be able to follow up with the payers, whether it be through um, joint operation, operating committee meetings with the payers or with managed care to make sure that we are not only getting feedback from the payers, but we're giving that feedback to them as well, to say, you know, we've appealed within your timeframes and we expect the same from you. So the payers also will define where you are to respond at each level and what that appeal level is to be called. Um, these technical types of denials are very sad when we don't have the right address that we needed to send things to, which again lead to timeline issues, time frame issues of not getting our appeals to the right place within the right time. So again, within content, we need time frames, contacts, and links to the provider's policies. So how do we develop this payer content? Well, again, reviewing national payer policies for all payers, including the third party auditors who may be coming back and auditing and denying cases after they have been paid is also very important. Again, the contract language, the timeframes may be different between the payers and the third party auditors working on behalf of those payers. We really need to um, develop front end methods that help providers engage denials early and ensure earned revenues get paid. So this again goes back to the point of um, really having at the fingertips of even the clinical folks that are on the front end of really understanding what documentation is required of each payer. Um, these policies are typically very specific to the payers, as Dr. Smith mentioned, um, each payer having very specific documentation and either, even authorization requirements for our patients. Um, this can lead to often very high dollar and even high volume denials if we're not uh, meeting the payers' requirements. The result in this is a lengthy appeals process and you're really at the mercy of the payer unless you go to some type of external review. Um, typically, this is tying up your resources to appeal these denials, and these resources can be highly costive as well to our provider because these folks need to be clinical professionals if you really want quality appeals. I'll turn this back over to Dr. Smith to start talking about artificial intelligence as well as augmented intelligence. Great, so there's a lot of buzz around the initials AI. Every, every 
um, article you read related to current healthcare trends will mention uh, AI. And I, I think it's, it's clear to us at least that not all artificial intelligence is, is really artificial intelligence. It, it sometimes makes me chuckle when you see some of the things that are being bandied about as um, artificial intelligence processes, and, and they're really fall far short of that. So I, I think starting by defining the concepts of artificial and augmented intelligence as relates to um, hospital revenue cycle, denial of workflows, et cetera, is, is helpful here. Um, artificial intelligence is the ability of a computer or a robot controlled by a computer to do tasks that are usually done by humans, um, requiring human intelligence and the ability to discern different facts. Augmented intelligence is a design pattern uh, consisting of a human-centered partnership model of people and artificial intelligence working together to enhance or augment uh, human cognitive performance, including learning, decision-making, um, and exploring new experience. So most of what we're talking about and what we're proposing through this discussion is really one of augmented intelligence. We want to take the current skill sets and uh, knowledge bases of people involved in different aspects of the revenue cycle, um, primarily those of us involved in denials, and be able to work uh, through AI programs um, to really take this to uh, the next level. So while artificial intelligence is the creation of machines that work in, and duplicate human-like uh, actions and behaviors, um, augmented intelligence um, is a little less sinister, and I, I think it really exists to sort of turbocharge um, abilities of the human worker. Um, to get some of the noise out of our day-to-day -day existence, uh, make some of the tasks that we engage in on a regular basis uh, automatic and freeing us up uh, to work uh, smarter, not harder, work more effectively. We really need to be cognizant and make sure that we, uh, throughout this process, recognize the human factor in decision-making. Ultimately, we're dealing with uh, patients and clinical situations. Um, I think both ethically, um, socially, professionally, um, taking that interface and turning it over to a computer program is um, ripe for problems. We, we need ultimately to have some human oversight over this. I, I can't imagine a world right now where folks would get into a commercial plane uh, run fully by computers uh, with no one in the cockpit and feel completely comfortable that there wasn't someone there to take over in the event the computer made a incorrect or, or suboptimal um, decision. You all ultimately want to have a human brain and, and pair of hands uh, to stand by to intervene and, and kind of monitor this and, and really move some of this decision making forward. Augmented intelligence, what we're reviewing here is the potential to move the back end denial experience into some front end predictive payer behavioral profiles. So, Hospitals get thousands and thousands of, of denials a month, depending on their size. And that often creates a lot of, of noise in terms of looking in data. Um, but developing computer programs to sift through that noise um, will allow us to develop early warning systems for payers uh, with audits and denials before they can become a recurrent problem. The last thing that you want to do is start to look for the source of a problem because you started to see started to see a significant drop in hospital um, collections or profits. By that time, you, you've you know really developed significant problems. Uh, ultimately, I think in an ideal world, you'd like to be able to act by the time you got the second uh, denial for a specific procedure or even the first one um, to be able to go in take a look at that and develop some processes to denial proof uh, future episode, ep episodes of similar care so that denial doesn't recur. Um, this is what we're really talking about through the development of automated triggers, um, alerting clinical and administrative personnel of the need to action on specific cases. Um, payers are 
as I said earlier, ripe with inherent complexities. They're frequently changing the rules and moving the cheese. This is probably the biggest challenge that we, we face in this arena. Um, the onus or the burden is on the providers to make sure that they comply with these changing rules. And as we showed earlier in this discussion, this has to be done via upfront intervention efforts. Uh, you can't go uh, after the fact, um, after the horse is out of the barn and close the door and expect that you're going to keep the horse. The horse is long gone. So we've got to be able to react proactively um, when we get the first denial, find out what the root cause of that specific denial was, and then provide the information on the front end through an automated process to alert um, a clinician or uh, someone on the front end uh, the second time a similar um, situation starts to develop so that we don't uh, repeat ourselves, Groundhog Day ourselves, and end up with the second, third, and fourth denial. Um, in terms of operations, where, where there's a lot you can focus on. This world is almost infinite, and it can be a little overwhelming in terms of um, where you start to look in data and, and how you start to look for opportunities. So, like anything, you know, take the elephant one bite at a time. Um, what we tend to focus on working with uh, our client relationships are your top four or five uh, commercial payers and then the top 10 inpatient denial reasons. Uh, these are high dollar cases. These are cases that, you know, like the pacemaker we talked about earlier, $75,000 um, has been denied to the hospital for reimbursement, but the hospital is also out the uh, physical purchase cost of that defibrillator, which may have been $20,000. So it's, they've lost twice in that, that situation. By focusing on top 10 uh, inpatient denial reasons or top 10 inpatient or outpatient procedures for your top four or five uh, commercial or government payers, you're gonna find that you're probably capturing 60 to 80% of your denied revenue. Um, and, and being able to back that down and develop some processes or alerts um, to prevent those from recurring in the future is going to have an enormous and immediate impact and, and payback to the system for ultimately what is amounts to very little work. As Tracy said at the beginning of this conversation, the data feed that we view as necessary to be able to accomplish this, the ADT and HL7 data feed, is already coursing through your hospital IT system. And it's a question of being able to tap into that and use some computer programs and in wizardry to get the information routed to the right people at the right time to be able to act on it. I think we're all well aware of today's reality. Um, appeals are getting harder and harder to overturn and win. Um, I, I've seen some incredibly written appeals um, that in my mind um, should clearly have led to an overturn and the insurers are, are standing uh, put on their original decisions. Um, why, I, I could speculate any number of reasons. I don't think we need to get into it on this call, um, but ultimately it's getting harder and harder to overturn these things. Um, ultimately, um, payers are making the rules here, and if you don't follow the rules, um, you're either not gonna get paid initially or you're gonna get audited and the money's gonna be taken back after the fact, and it's gonna be impossible in most uh, circumstances to recoup that. Um, Overturn rates are down significantly. I think that's not a surprise to, to anyone. There's a lot to learn from evaluating and optimizing uh, your processes on a consistent basis. Um, using a third party resource to ensure that you are following specific payer rules and identifying the root causes of denials and audits is imperative. Um, developing a system to provide an alert when those payer rules or coverage policy bulletins or coverage policy guidelines change is also critical here. The last thing that you want to be doing is following a CPB um, that has been replaced by a new or modified one with different criteria, uh, thinking that you're uh, in, in the clear and then six months or a year later getting audited only to find out that you had the wrong CPB you were adhering to, that they Insurers had yet again moved the cheese on you and um, your systems didn't keep up with that. Um, ultimately, we want to be able to provide a medical record that is uh, defensible relative to external audits. It's no longer a question of whether the care was delivered. 
it's more a question of was the care delivered according to the rules set forth by the payer and demonstrating that uh, within the record itself. So I'll conclude at this point. Um, I know we've covered a lot of information today, um, a lot of different concepts. I, I think the biggest concept here is the need to get backend information um, through whatever means are available to you um, to the front end at the point of care to being able to uh, denial and audit proof uh, your episodes of care for your for your hospital. If we can assist you in any way or you have any questions, ideas, um, experience in this area, we'd love to hear from you. Um, our contact information is at the bottom of the slide. Um, either email or phone call and um, we'll get right back. So thanks very much for your time today. Appreciate it and uh, look forward to hearing from you.